Hey everybody, Paul Gray here. Thanks for joining me for another edition, another episode of Grace to All. Doing a little short few week series here on the first chapter of the book of Colossians. And I'm titling our talk today, uh, it's a, a mathematical uh, equation. I'm titling it all times 15 equals question mark. So as we go through what we're talking about today, we're going to see what that means. All times 15 equals what? Now, the point of our teaching from last week was always listen to the teacher, capital T, the spirit, Christ in you, grace, truth, the spirit of truth, <clears throat> whatever you want to call the spirit. Always listen to the spirit in you and let the spirit show you what scripture means and everything else, too. Don't go by Bible commentaries. Boy, I made that mistake for so many years. Don't go by Bible dictionaries unless Christ in you, grace, confirms what they say. Let the spirit of truth in you, Jesus in you, the living word of God, confirm. So that way, when you hear or see something that contradicts who Jesus is, what Jesus is like, what Jesus tells you, <clears throat> then you know it's not true. I'm going to give you a few verses on this. John, Jesus' best friend here on earth, uh, wrote this in 1 John 2, 26 and 27. He said, my intention with this writing is to nullify the influence of those who wish to unsettle you. And boy, when you start seeing the unconditional love of God for everyone, that grace covers everything, that God is pure light with no trace of darkness, there are people that will come at you and try to unsettle you. And they'll go, well, what about this? But what about that? But what about, but this verse says, but what, whoa, whoa, no, they, they want to unsettle you. They're not bad people. Uh, they're just not on the same track that you are yet. John goes on to say, I'm convinced that the effect of Christ touch within you is permanent. This is the Christ anointing that teaches you all things. So you do not need any teacher whose doctrine does not resonate with truth. Deception cannot compete with spirit resources. That's the mirror translation. <clears throat> Passion says it this way. The wonderful anointing you've received from God is so much greater than their deception. And the anointing now lives in you. There's no need for anyone to keep teaching you. His anointing teaches you all that you need to know, for it will lead you into truth, not counterfeit. So just as the anointing has taught you, remain in him. Another couple of verses. <clears throat> First John 4, 14. Jesus says, if anybody drinks the living water I give them, they'll never be thirsty again. That's not First John. It's actually John. He, he's talking to the woman at the well. If anyone drinks the living water I give them, they will never be thirsty again. For when you drink the water I give you, it becomes a gushing fountain of the Holy Spirit flooding you with endless life. Now, the living water Jesus is talking about is not H2O. It, it's uh, symbolic. It means words of truth, Jesus' words, gushing from the Holy Spirit in your spirit, flooding your heart and overflowing to your mind. And those thoughts will all be just like Jesus. Perfect, pure love, light, joy, peace, grace, and goodness with no trace of darkness. One more scripture here. John 6, 63. Jesus says, it is the spirit that quickens the poetry of life. The flesh, muscle, and willpower, or ego, is use useless without the spirit. Jesus says, the words that I speak to you, and he speaks to us today, are spirit and life. He says, I communicate from a different dimension and perspective, giving voice and substance to every prophetic shadow and purpose. So here's the primary takeaway from last week and really from any teaching for everything we do in life. Don't take my word or any other Bible teacher's word for what scripture means or doctrine or anything like that. Always go to the teacher in you the spirit of Christ in you. Always go to Christ in you and listen to what Christ says. Now today, keep that in mind in this teaching today. First, uh, or in Colossians chapter one, verses 10 through 20, we're going to talk about. 
There's a Greek word in here. Uh, the Greek word is pas, P-A-S. It's used at least 15 times, and it means all, A-L-L. -L. Sometimes we take that Greek word and translators translate it as all, each, every, all things, all men, every man. Strong's, which is a Bible commentary that's revered almost as much as the Bible as being infallible, says this, pas, P-A-S, the Greek word pas means all, each, every, any, all, the whole, everyone, all things, everything. It says the, it's used 1,243 times in the New Testament in the King James. 1,210 of those, it's translated as all. Seven times it's in the Greek manuscripts we have, but it's not even translated. 26 times it's other miscellaneous words. So the point is there, all but 0.026% of the times the word appears in the Greek in the New Testament, it's translated as all. Sometimes it's translated as each, every, all things, all men, every man. However, Strong's also says, very rarely does the all mean all persons. The words are generally used to signify that Christ has redeemed some of all sorts of people. Now, I and most biblical scholars today ask, oh, according to who? According to who does all very rarely mean all. Who says that? <laughs> well, I can tell you, those with a religious agenda who don't want all to mean all. They want all to mean them, and those who believe like they do, and say the magic prayer like they do, and go to the classes, they, all of that kind of stuff. I've had numerous people, including very intelligent folks, and friends, and family, and loved ones, and other people that I don't know anything about, Look me right in the eye and say, well, we know all only means some. And it's very hard for me to <laughs> disguise my, my uh, feelings when I hear somebody look me in the eye and say that. Now, here's the deal. They've been taught that. They've heard it over and over again by people in pulpits with letters after their names. <clears throat> uh, and they, you know, they, they just heard that so often that they now think that it's got to be true, but it's really ridiculous. It's like looking somebody in the eye and saying, well, yellow is yellow, uh, except when it's red. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's ridiculous. Now, I'm not going to disparage those people, judge them, make fun on them, uh, or dwell on this. Uh, just remember, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They simply don't know what they're doing. And he says that about us, you and me, a lot as well. Now, I am going to ask you, don't check your intellect at the door of whatever religious denomination you happen to go into on any given Sunday. Don't just check your intellect. Ask questions and never take what I or any other spiritual teacher, Bible teacher, or commentary, don't just take for granted that what we say is true. Go to the spirit in you, Christ in you, and ask, what does it mean? Now, to begin with today, in the 10 verses that we're going to look at in Colossians 1, the Apostle Paul uses that word, Greek word pas, P-A-S, all 15 times. And in my opinion, every time it means all. So I want you to let the teacher in you verify or refute that. So here we go today. Colossians 1.10. Go on. This is the mirror. Go on a walkabout tour to explore the extent of the land that is yours under Jesus' lordship. Now you can conduct yourselves appropriately towards him, pleasing him in every or all harvest of good works that you bear. Now, go on the walkabout tour to explore the land. Land doesn't mean the real estate that you own. I believe it means... <laughs> everything that you have from God, every single thing that you have from God. And of course, Peter tells us, us in 2 Peter 1, he's given us everything, everything we need for life and godliness. All right. Pleasing him in every harvest of good works that you bear. 
Well, what are the good works that we bear for God? Here's what Jesus said, John 6, 29. Somebody says, What's the, what are the works of God we're supposed to do? And Jesus says, this is the word, work of God that you believe in, adhere to, trust in, and rely on and have faith in Jesus, the one whom God sent. So what are the works of God? Listen to Christ in you and do what he asks you to do in any given moment. That's the concept of obedience. There is no Hebrew word for obey. It, the word that we incorrectly translate obey means to listen, to hear. All right, verse 11, Colossians 1. You, that you and me, are empowered in the dynamic of God's strength. His mind is made up about you. He enables you to be strong in endurance and steadfast with joy. Passion says it this way. We pray that you would be energized with all his explosive power from the realm of his magnificent glory, filling you with great hope. Now, what I would encourage you there to do is to be quiet, no distractions, no sound on, no devices or whatever, and, and just say to whatever you call the Holy, you can call the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, whatever you want to, just say, Holy Spirit, Christ in me. What does it mean that I am empowered in the dynamic of your strength, that I'm energized with all your explosive power? And then let the Holy Spirit tell you what it means. I, I have my understanding of what it means, but... I want you to ask the Holy Spirit what it means. Verse 12. We are grateful to the Father who qualified us to participate in the complete portion, or it, that's the word all, of the inheritance of the saints of the light. All the inheritance of the saints in the light. Passion says it this way. Your hearts can soar with joyful gratitude when you think of how God made you worthy to receive the glorious inheritance freely given to us by living in the light. Now, I have a course called poor, <laughs> poor, Pure Light Walker. Living in the light means listening to Christ in you, God who is pure light with no trace of darkness, and taking sides with him, believing what he says. All right. Now, Paul gets into some really heavy stuff here. He says, God rescued us from the dominion of darkness or the sense-ruled world dominated by the law of performance and relocated us into the kingdom where the love of his son rules, the kingdom of light. That's from the mirror. Francois Dutoit uh, comments on that. And he says, darkness is not a force. It's the absence of light. A darkened understanding veiled the truth of our redeemed design from us. What empowered the darkness was the lie that we believed about ourselves and God and all other people. But Jesus, Paul says, rescued us from that. The Passion says it this way. God has rescued us completely from the tyrannical rule of darkness and has translated us to the kingdom realm of Jesus. You have already been rescued or redeemed, taken from the kingdom of darkness, and been transported, translated, transmogrified into the kingdom of light. That's already true, the passage says, for all people. Well, does all mean all? Ask the Holy Spirit to tell you. Verse 14. In God's mind, mankind, all human beings, are associated in Christ. In his blood sacrifice, we were uh, ransomed. Our redemption was secured. All our sins were completely done away with. Passion says it this way. Most other translations say it's something like this. For in Christ, all our sins are canceled, and we have the release of redemption through his very blood. Ask the Holy Spirit in you to reveal to you, what does that mean? All your sins are canceled. Does it mean all? Let me ask you this. Assuming that's true, just for assumption's sake, if all your sins have been forgiven, have been canceled and been taken away, 
then what is there for God to judge about you right now or on the day of the great white throne judgment, which is another subject? What is there for God to punish you for? What is there for you to ask for forgiveness for? If all your sins are canceled, all, and we have the release of redemption through his very blood, does all mean all? Hmm. Verse 15, Colossians 1. In Christ, the image and likeness of God is made visible in human form in order that all people may recognize their true origin in him. He is the firstborn of every creature. What darkness veiled from us, he unveiled. In him, we clearly see the mirror reflection of our original life. The son of God's love gives accurate evidence of his image in human form. The incarnation means that God can never again be invisible. John chapter 1 verse 9 says, Jesus, the true light, comes into the world and enlightens all men. <laughs> Let me say that again. John, 1 John 1, 9, look it up, pretty much whatever translation you want. Jesus, the true light of the world, capital L, comes into the world and enlightens all mankind. Here's how the Passion says that. Jesus is the divine portrait, the true likeness of the invisible God and the firstborn heir of all creation. For in him was created the universe of things, both in the heavenly realm and on the earth. All that is seen and all that is unseen, every seat of power, every realm of government, principality, and authority, yet all exist through him and for his purpose. Well, let me ask you, does it mean all, or does it just mean some of all? I hope you're starting to get the picture <clears throat> that religious people, institutions, whatever, have had to just say the unbelievable, that all doesn't mean all, <clears throat> in order to give credence to what they believe, <clears throat> that some are in, some are out, that God arbitrarily decided not to include all people. And when you, <laughs> when you look at it with a sober, open mind, and especially when you ask the Holy Spirit of Christ in you to help you reveal what it means, you're going to hear does all mean all or not? Verse 16, everything or all things begins in Christ, whether in the heavenly realm or upon the earth, visible or invisible. He is the original blueprint of all order of justice, all level of authority, kingdoms or governments, principalities, jurisdiction. The original form of all things were founded by Jesus and created for him. Any order that does not mirror Christ is a distortion of man's own making. So just another question there. Does all mean all here? Verse 17, Christ is the initiator of all things. Therefore, all, everything, finds its relevance and its true pattern only in him. Passion says it this way. Christ existed before anything was made. And now all things find completion in him. Hmm. Paul is really just nailing it down here that all Jesus created all things. He's in all things. All things are for him. All people are included. Everybody, all people have been moved from darkness to light. All sin has been forgiven. Unless you don't think all means all. Verse 18. The ecclesia, that's the Greek word for church, is the visible expression or the body of which Jesus is the head. Jesus is the principal rank of authority who leads the triumphant per, uh, procession of our new birth out of the region of the dead. His preeminent rank is beyond threat. Passion says it this way. Jesus is the head of his body, which is the church. And since he is the beginning and the firstborn heir in resurrection, he is the most exalting one, holding first place in 
all things. Hmm. 19, verse 19. God is fully at home in Christ. Jesus exhibits God happy delight to be human. For the Passion says, God is satisfied to have all his fullness dwelling in Christ. Does all the fullness of God dwell in Christ? Well, I think so. Here's some questions for you now. As scripture says, and we've taught before, does Christ live in you? Well, if he does, and I believe he does, then all the fullness of God lives in you. As scripture says, you are just like Christ is in this world. Well, if that's true, does all of Christ, all the fullness of God live in you? The fullness of God lives in you now and forever. We have no idea of what that means, what's available to us, the power, the energy, the wisdom that we have. We're just barely tapping into it. Here's the last verse for today, Colossians 1.20. God initiated the reconciliation of all to himself. All. Through the blood of the cross, God restored the original harmony. His reign of peace now extends to all things, every visible thing on the earth, as well as those invisible things which are in the heavenly realms. Not only that, Francois says in the translation, but all the broken and dislocated pieces of the universe, people and things, animals and atoms, get properly fixed and fit together in vibrant harmonies, all because of his death. Now, that, that's actually from the message. It's quoted in the mirror. But uh, <laughs> so, all right, here's the last translation, the passion. The, by the blood of his cross, all things in heaven and earth are brought back to himself, back to their original intent, restored to innocence again. The restoration of all things. All times 15 in that passage equals what? I believe all equals all. <laughs> I believe it means all. But I don't want you to take my word for it. Ask the Holy Spirit of Christ in you. Get quiet. Turn off all the devices. Set aside what you can the voices that maybe you hear your pastor talking about in church when you were growing up, set aside different versions of, of uh, cliff notes or commentary from Bibles. I, I had a commentary that I used when I started in the ministry that I just believed every word that it said. I just took it. I was told by somebody else who I respected that it was all right. And I just, you know, I'd read a passage and then I'd look at that commentary down at the bottom of the page and I say, well, OK, this is what it means. <laughs> no, that's what it meant to one person. And I've learned now one person who thought all doesn't mean all. So you ask the Holy Spirit of Christ in you. Does all mean all to you? And then go with the, what the Holy Spirit says to you. Hey, thanks, everybody. Appreciate you being with me for another edition of Grace to all with Paul Gray. I'll see you next time. Grow in grace.